going to continue with, with me. Uh, we're very happy to have him. Uh, and he will, talk us, he will tell us something about cosmological natural selection. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and talk about bounces. Um, I want to mention that I first heard about bounces from Bryce DeWitt of my first postdoc at ITP in Santa Barbara. Bryce came to my office and said, you know, something interesting you should work on is what happens when black hole singularities bounce. Do they make you new universes? And the idea that black holes bounce and make new universes, or cosmological singularities bounce and make new universes, goes back at least to speculation by John Wheeler, by Bryce DeWitt in the early mid-60s. Okay, so this is an idea that, that thinking about that led to. Um, plus another thing that one of my mentors said to me, Steve Weinberg, he said, every once in a while, think about the weak interactions. It'll do you good. It did me good. And so this came from the inspiration of those two mentors. And it's an idea from a long time ago, but it's an idea that made, very surprisingly, some predictions. And those predictions are not just whether they have held up or not is not the important point, although in fact, as far as I know, they have held up. But the fact that there's a cosmological model that makes falsifiable predictions about the coupling constants of the standard model is, as far as I know, unique, and there's an important lesson to be gained from this. So what's the issue? Um, Particle physics has, Stefan said 20, but he forgot about the neutrino mass matrix. There's about 27 free parameters of the standard model of particle physics, free dimensionless parameters, and we have no idea why they have the values that they have. There's a landscape of particles, of parameters, which is analogous to the notion of a landscape in fitness biology. And that indeed, that analogy between the landscape of the space, the 27 dimensional space of the parameters of the standard model, and the space of gene sequences in biology is the origin of the use of the term landscape in, in multiverse theories and things like that. So how are we going to explain why the parameters of the standard model are what they are in our universe? That's what this, model, this, what this hypothesis is explained to do. And it utilizes bounces, as you'll see. Yes? Can I just ask a quick question? In, in biology, the fitness landscape would be many more parameters than 27. Right? Yes. Well, aren't you surprised how few there are? <laughs> <laughs> are you? <laughs> yes. It's going to be amazing. The, the whole universe has only 27 parameters. It's incredible. Because physics is so essential in biology. Right. <laughs> right. So that's Once the, you understand that, that's the clue. Let's come back to that. Okay. Now, not only are the root values of these parameters a problem, but they're Actual values are very mysterious. There is the fine-tuning problem, why some of them are very small in, de in terms of ratios, like the Planck scale to the proton mass or the cosmological constant scale of the electron mass and the neutrino mass to the top quark. There also is the special tuning problem, and this is usually connected to the anthropic principle, but independent of what you think of the anthropic principle as a methodology or a principle, there's a claim which has been made by many people, and disputed, and uh, we can dispute it after I'm done talking. But um, the claim is that in this parameter space, in this landscape, there's a small region that has long-lived stars, many stable nuclei, complex chemistry, supernova, that the things that make our universe complex are restricted to a, to a small region in this parameter space. Now, I'm not going to argue that claim, but I'm going to assert it. Sorry, where is that region located with respect to your peak scale? Is it like in the middle or is it? It's down in the corner because of the okay, hierarchy the issue. UV scale and infrared scale and this scale. No, 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 these are dimensionless parameters. Oh, so you, when you talk about scale, what do you mean? Sorry. Oh, you mean parameters? Yeah, parameters. So, this, so, the, so the masses and Planck units, the mixing angles, which are dimensionless, the coupling constants, which are dimensionless the various parameters of the mass matrix in Planck units, which are dimensionless, okay. all these parameters. OK, so that's the question, is to, explain, is to explain them. Now, I'm going to skip these slides in case I need, this is in case somebody challenges me. This is, for example, the list of different ways to destabilize, 
its nuclei by changing the parameters by a little bit. This is the ways to give up the universe's long and stars by changing the parameters a little bit. These all are stolen from Barrow and Tiflin. Now, here's the idea. And this idea was first expressed lucidly, as it is here, by Charles Sanders Peirce in 1893. And I'll read just the last two lines. Law is par excellence, the thing that wants a reason. That is, it's not enough to say what the laws of physics are. We have to explain why those are the laws. And then he asserts, the only possible way of accounting for the laws of nature is to suppose them results of evolution. Now, if I were a good scholar, I would have read Peirce and studied Peirce and then invented the idea that I'm about to present to you. But let's pretend that that happened. <laughs> Okay. So now, do you think this is the only way? I mean, what, what about the principle we use, like locality, causality? Like, he claims they're not sufficient. What? He claims they're not sufficient. But uh, we can argue everything that we, everything I say, every slide, is volumes of arguments. So let me give, lay out the picture, and then we can argue if you like. Okay. No, no, okay. Just, just to, to put the. Like, he cl- he, principles are useful, but they're not sufficient. Uh, is the claim. My own inspiration for this, can we say, I I cut the quote from the from the talk to shorten the talk. But there was the moment when Andy Strominger realized that there were not hundreds of thousands of Kalabi Yavkin pactifications; there were vast, uncountable numbers of of pactifications past Kalabi Yavkin. He wrote a paper in 1987 that said all predictive power in string theory is lost because even if we could find a version of the theory that agreed with the standard model and the choice of parameters, it wouldn't mean anything because there's a vast number to choose from. And that's what got me thinking along that line was that paper of Andy's, as well as him sitting down and complaining to me about how the ground was undercut from the agenda of physics. Okay. So supposing you want to follow Percy's advice and invent a scheme. This is what I challenge myself to do. Invent a scheme that tried to answer the question of what, how the parameters are chosen by making a cosmological scenario which was analogous to natural selection, worked analogously to natural selection. And that's the scenario that I want to show you. But more generally, to apply natural selection to a theory, it must have the following ingredients. A space of parameters, such as genes or the parameters of the standard model. A mechanism of reproduction of entities, whether it's organisms or universes. A mechanism for those parameters to change slightly on reproduction, that slightly is very important. And reproductive success, that is how many children you have, depending strongly, at least in some regions of the parameter space on the parameters. If you have those ingredients abstractly, you can run to some standard arguments from population biology. And you argue as follows. On the landscape, you graph a function which is the fitness, which is the number of children that an entity has is a function of the parameters. And under these assumptions, and a random start, that you start with one entity somewhere randomly in the parameter space, which reproduces itself, and develops a population in the parameter space, that population will condense and will be most probably at or centered on local, local maxima of the fitness. The fitness, again, is the number of children that you successfully have. And again, that's a textbook lecture, and I'm not going to give it, but that's a standard argument from population biology. So, isn't there another, uh, there seems to be another hypothesis here that uh, you know what to count. Is the number of children the number of protons, the number of photons? Obviously, no, 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 obviously. Because that that creates different fitness. Absolutely, absolutely. Which, which. Let me make the. the, the, So, you have to kind of. I, absolutely. Okay. Now, the cosmological model, which was inspired by listening to my mentors, Bryce DeWitt and Steve Weinberg, because I was worried about the parameters because I was worried about the weak coupling constant and why it had the value it had, because Steve told me to worry about the weak interactions. Um, and I was thinking about balances because Bri- I kept trying to make sense of why does Bryce want me to think about balances. Of course, we didn't know at that time that there would be a, several different approaches to quantum gravity that would have models of balances. There was no such, 
Well, they were crummy models, which were sort of semi-classical, and who and somebody and somebody. Does anybody remember these guys anymore? Yeah. Well, also in those days, the cycle, I mean, the K equal to one cosmology, uh, you know, was yeah. popular. And we there, for some reasons, avoided the question of what happens at the end of the big crunch. And just said, that, well, it just, the universe can just keep going. And the universe keeps cycling and recycling. And there are endless... Uh, yeah. There's a lot, large number of John Peter's thoughts about this. So that's why one may not even think about quantum gravity. Right, but also black holes. In fact, if you look in Isn't John Wheeler in chapter 44 or whatever, which is the one where they went John Wheeler, let John Wheeler go crazy without an editor, <laughs> uh, he talks about black holes becoming new universes, reprocessed, and he talks about the parameters of physics being reprocessed, as he called it, on every one of those bounces. The only thing that I added... So these are the hypotheses that I made. Black hole singularities bounce to initiate new universes. And the standard model parameters change randomly and slightly on each bounce. The only thing I added to Johnny Wheeler's speculations was slightly. <laughs> which was significant because, again, you only can climb the hills of fitness if you have small changes from generation to generation. If you, have, if you fluctuate all over the landscape on every change, you're never going to accumulate fitness. Accumulated fitness requires that parents be very similar to their children, but not the same. So that's slightly, and that slightly is in what units, these are dimensionless parameters, is in units which are small compared to the gradient of the fitness. Do you eventually want to use this to actually predict what the parameters are? I'm going to, I'm going to explain some aspects of them and predict other aspects, yes. Because, I mean, in evolution we have birds and fish and all other minima. You know, Right, so there's lots of local maxima of fitness. There's lots of ways to locally maximize fitness. And let me, let me say a little bit more. No, let me say it now. The, well, <coughs> let me make a comment and then I'll make an important comment. So, sorry, when you say slightly, you have a, um, is there a reason for that? Or it's yes, I just gave it to the right. If, if you don't... If, if the population doesn't evolve no, slowly on this... Oh, no. So, no. No. We have to explain that. We have to explain that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's an important thing that I realized. The, the special tunings are the parameters of low-energy physics. They're the parameters mostly that, that affect atomic physics and nuclear physics. They're not sophisticated things having to do with top quarks and... So what they have to do with the first generation of particles. So the method of reproduction should involve atomic physics and chemistry so that the fitness can be sensitive to the special tunings of the observed parameters. That is, that region in the parameter space is picked out that has complex chemistry, that has long-lived stars, that has many stable nuclei. It's picked out by the properties of nuclear and atomic and physics and chemistry. And therefore, the method of reproduction, if it's going to tune you the special values of parameters that affect that physics has to depend on that physics. There can't be things happening at a grand unification scale. And that was my important clue. I note that black hole formation involves atomic physics and chemistry very explicitly. If you start to investigate, if you start off as a naive quantum gravity person, and you all of a sudden have to investigate how black holes form, you have to get an education in astronomy and astrophysics and learn all about giant molecular clouds and cooling. Like the one secret that astrophysicists never tell you, which is the secret to astrophysics, is that things have to cool to clump. Right? They never tell you that, but that's the, that's the secret to everything in astrophysics. Therefore, you need a coolant, and you need, if you have sources of radiation around like stars, you need shielding and coolants. And that's where chemistry comes in. What if you just have gravity interaction? Things don't clump. You would not get you would not get disk galaxies. You would not get stars with just no, gravitation. Black holes. Probably very few. Why? If you just angular, have gravity, moment, angular momentum stops you falling in. How would you generate? If you don't have interaction, you need dissipation. You have to have dissipation. Okay. I mean, but can you have gravity waves? It's too yeah, slow. Yeah, yeah, so black holes can form just by pulling. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but many fewer, many fewer form that way. Very many few. few, very few. 
And, I, and I'll come to how many if you let me. That's, that's something I had to work on. How many if you let me? Okay, so the fitness, I've really already said this, the fitness has to depend strongly on the parameters. And those arguments that I pointed to briefly, that there's a small region in the parameter space that have long-lived stars, that have complex chemistry, that have many stable nuclei, plus the story about black holes in our universe, mostly, if you count them, and now this is the last question, how do you count? You count universe by universe, so that means if one black hole goes to one universe, which is a hypothesis, you count black hole by black hole. And you ask, there are different kinds of black holes in the, in the universe. There may be primordial black holes, which are formed by primordial fluctuations, and I can come back and address those. There are huge black holes at the centers of galaxies, who, as far as I know, their formation is obscure. And there are stellar black holes, and uh, I'm, they're on the order of 10 million to a billion of those in a typical spiral galaxy. There's black holes which are the end state of evolution of massive stars following supernovas. And those are, by counting, by far the most numerous, so those are the ones we're concerned with. And to form those, you need to form very massive stars. To form very massive stars, you need to get a lot of stuff to cool and dissipate. And to do that, you need carbon monoxide for the coolant, you need water for the shielding. And that's why, if you start to look at all the chemistry that's involved in the formation of stars massive enough to reliably go to black holes at their end, after they supernova, you end up with organic chemistry. Carbon monoxide is the coolant and water is the shield. I didn't make that up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by the shield? The giant molecular cloud. The galaxy has a, a typical ambient temperature, the galactic disk, of, that is the gas and the dust in the galaxy, has many phases, but the largest phase is sort of the phase that's not doing much, and it's typically at about 200 degrees. That's not cold enough to clump large stars. To clump large stars, you need clouds of a few degrees above absolute zero. And to get that, they need to have coolant, i.e. carbon monoxide is the most common, and you need to shield them to, from starlight, especially from light from ultraviolet light from massive stars. But, but okay, I mean, you, you've stated the fitness is basically your ability to make black holes. Yes. And why? Why? Because if you make more black holes, you, you dominate the population. Now, here we have the population of universes. Pick a typical one. A typical one likely had parents, since the parameters are close to the parents' parameters, that had parameters that, made, that resulted in many black holes being made. So, so you're saying black holes are the only things that reproduce? Yes. So therefore, selection works in their favor? Yes. Because of my assumption that black hole singularity is bounds, it's a big assumption. It's a big assumption. Black hole singularity is bounds. Nothing else can. Let's assume it's there. And they now. The only mechanism for production is that. It is why you need black Yes. This is the mechanism. Yes. Of course, people are doing inflation, so they have another mechanism. I, I will address that. If you, it's so, all a question of how much time you give me, how much I, how long I survive. So if I try to formulate what you think, you start from a, I think, you know, you start from a phase space, and you're saying, well, you're assuming that this black hole bounce is the way you kind of modify the content of that phase space. Right. And, and the content of that phase space, you're changing you're allowed to change the number of degrees of freedom and some parameters. Right, but I focus on the low energy parameters because they're the ones that affect the physics that goes into how many black holes the universe has. And also, all my reasoning is local in the parameter space. The, the statement that I come to for using the method of population biology, whose details I'm skipping, is that almost, is that you're going to be near a local maximum of the fitness. There's no statement about global maxima. There's no statement about other local maxima. All we can do, because this is all we can, you know, I don't claim to be that our science is good enough that if you take the parameters to be orders of magnitude different to predict what the physics or what the astrophysics would be. 
I claim that, this, that astrophysics and physics may be good enough to ask, what if we take one of the parameters, say the electron mass in Planck units, and decrease it by 50% or double it? What's the effect on astrophysics and the formation of black holes? So I'm only concerned with local changes. And the prediction is, or the claim, is that almost every local change in the parameters should lead to a decrease in fitness, that is, to a universe that is less copiously productive of black holes. That's so this is a vacuum energy, looks like the obvious answer. I have a slide for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is, if I remember... That isn't, that isn't an answer. I mean, you're just having a slide. <laughs> you mean the so you you eternal, to to eternal like, inflation? No, no, I'm just saying today's vacuum energy. If I just lowered it a bit, I would be able to get more black holes. I think it was the original worry of Einstein that, that oh, if I have a universe and there's gravity and it's closed, then the whole thing that can happen to it is that it just collapses. So that's because gravity is attractive and it's not range, right? Yeah, and so that's so seems... you need to have a you need. I mean, yeah, a single, a a single closed oscillating universe yeah. would seem to be very efficient. So you need to use a yourself. Everybody in itself would Yeah, black mass, you know, closed universe. Would just so let me repeat, I have nothing to say about choice of the parents which are far from the present ones. Sure. Okay. Okay. No problem. So no, but, but, yes. but, but I'm, I'm saying something much more modest. Let's take okay. today's yeah, yeah, so let me, because I realize I don't have a slide for that. I have a slide oh, okay. for eternal inflation. So let me tell you what I know about that. Okay. If you, there's the original argument of Weinberg. If you take that there is a critical value of the dark energy, such that if the dark energy is above that, no galaxies form. Right. And hence, no, not many black holes are made. Right. But if I lower it, I get more black holes. So that seems to show me that the value of omega lambda today is very unlikely with your criteria. If you lower it, you, if you get... lower it, you get lots more black holes. Why do you get more black holes if you lower it? Because more structure formation. I mean, lambda is responsible for switching off structure formation. Yes. So the question is, structure formation is going to switch off when galaxies run out of gas, so to speak. The, the, the galaxies yeah, have fired over... If you're building a lambda zero, that would never happen. You just but, keep making bigger and bigger and bigger galaxies. Back, the, back, you can find astronomy and astrophysics textbooks back before 97 <laughs> when we didn't know there was dark energy. And they say that black, that, that stellar formation in galaxies has a finite lifetime into the future just from the process of the gas and galaxies exhausting themselves. And I'm not an astrophysicist, so I'm just quoting. Right. But that's what my claim let's is. Let's focus on the omega lambda. If I change the omega lambda from 0.7 to 0.65, I think It doesn't do much. I get a lot smaller black hole. I don't think so. Yeah, I think so. You can calculate the growth rates. So you think that dark energy, energy is going to cut off structure formation before Absolutely. gases? That's what's happening today. It's very clear. Okay, so he may, he may have a better argument than I do about that. Okay. Let me keep going. Sure. Yeah. Can different distinct universe exchange energy apart from this? Uh, no, I... Uh, no. Then, then after a lot of generations, the energy on each universe will be decreasing. No, because, because these are... give many child and the energy is branches away. Yeah, but, but if omega is one, which is very common, then the total mass, the total energy of the universe is close to zero or zero. So you don't need energy to create a universe in a balance. Yeah. So thank you for a question I can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the, the answer to what uh, Neil is saying is that we're just not there yet, right? That this parameter is still being driven. We're not at the end of our uh, And yeah, then you can point. get around. Good point. Well, that's, and, that's why there's almost... It's on the way down. Yeah, yeah that's, I mean, I, this might also explain why the cosmological constant swap as well drive that swap. Yeah, that's that's the almost that's there. A good, good point. Okay, <laughs> listen. I think I um, just have a few more slides. So you get the basic idea. So then um, I got interested in astrophysics and astronomy, and this is just to impress you. This is the flow diagram that you need to go to make black holes after uh, supernova remnants. And the main thing to say is that it's complicated. Supernovas make shock waves that cause collapse of giant electric clouds. Giant electric clouds 
are cooled by dust and gas, which come from supernovas. So there's a, in fact, the whole system is a wonderful dynamical nonlinear system. It's far from thermodynamic equilibrium. It's quite complex. And you basically, what you're interested in is how does changing the parameters of the standard model disrupt the processes that lead to copious production of black hole as remnants of supernova. And so in your diagram, you mentioned that twice. Is the goal to maximize viscosity so that you, you just, you know, you create more viscosity? The goal at this point... So if you maximize viscosity, then you, you have more black hole as the idea? Um, not generically viscosity. There are particular pathways that lead hydrogen gas. Yeah. And then you maximize the cooling, the gas, the dust. You minimize the amount of expulsions of matter. Right. It just makes things come faster. Right. But the way that I proceeded was to try to understand what the actual situation is, what the actual story is in a disk galaxy, to make a con- One of the surprises to a, a naive astronomer is that star formation, massive star formation, didn't happen when the galaxy condensed five or ten billion years ago. It's continually happening. There's a continual rate of star formation of about one solar mass a year in a mature disk galaxy. So what drives that? And it's these nonlinear processes. I have a curiosity. Do they, so the universe is in your picture. Do they die from old age? Or it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I, there's no penalty for living forever in this context. <laughs> Okay, so I want to, I think I've taken enough time, I want to close, but let me just say, um, go quickly through this and get to my, I claimed that I had two predictions, so let me get to the, in fact, I'll skip this and come back to that if people want to discuss the details. Um, But let me rest on this. My claim is that these hypotheses, if they're correct, explain the special tunings of the standard model of particle physics. They explain why we have complex chemistry. They explain why we have long-lived stars. And there's a long story to tell about every one of those things and how having those things contributes to there being copious black hole production. Now, I claim also two predictions and two quite falsifiable predictions. One is that at the very end, you have a supernova, and there's a remnant, the results from the supernova, and that has a mass of typically on the order of a few solar masses. And that remnant, if light enough, will become a neutron star. There's a, however, there's a limit to how massive a neutron star can be called the upper mass limit of neutron stars. And you need remnants as many as possible to be above that. So one thing you definitely want to give fitness to is lowering the upper mass limit. How can the upper mass limit be lowered to the maximum amount consistent with standard nuclear physics and standard atomic physics, because you don't want to disrupt any of the things that led you to have supernovas and supernova remnants. So there, the question of what is the upper mass limit of neutron stars is a naughty nuclear astrophysics problem. A uh, few people are good at it. I'm not one of them. But roughly, the story is that there is various scenarios which depend on, which depend on the equation of state of neutron stars. And people get estimates anywhere from two and a half solar masses to three to four solar masses for the upper mass limit. No higher. Four? Five. Five, okay. And if somebody knows more than me is not surprising. I mean it's not even finished. It could be up to five, that's uh, Okay. But Hans Bade and Jerry Brown had a hypothesis that neutron stars, their cores are not actually neutrons, they're chaos condensates. And this goes like the following. As the, as the core condenses, normally what happens is protons interact with electrons to become neutrons, plus neutrinos, of course. But and there's another pathway to stability, which is that the electrons could decay to K minuses, and you could get a condensation of protons and neutrons in K minuses. How can that happen? Because K minuses are sort of 400 G. MEV, sorry, 400 MEV, and the electron is much lighter. Well, in the nuclear mass material, it's very condensed. The electron mass gets renormalized up, and the k mass gets renormalized down. So there's a value for the k mass 
such that neutron stars will become K ion condensates. And the importance of that is that when they're K ion condensates, they have two fermionic species in them. And their equations of state are much softer, and the upper mass limit is lower, somewhere between 1.7 and 2 solar masses, depending on the modeling. So the conclusion is that nature has an option, because nature controls the strange quark mass, which controls the Karen mass. And the strange quark mass hasn't come to any of the other phenomenology we've discussed. So nature has an option to tune the Karen mass by tuning the strange quark mass to the point where, star, where neutron stars are K-condensates, and the upper mass limit is lower than with other scenarios. So this is a prediction. If, if the whole story is true, nature must have taken advantage of this. Therefore, the upper mass limit of neutron stars cannot be heavier than two solar masses. And that's my first falsifiable prediction. And I didn't... Is the prediction actually that you have this K-N in the center of... Yes. So that has... It's more, it's more than just the upper limit. Yeah, there are th- things about cooling rates and so forth, which again... Or also your crystal state. Yes. Yeah, which may become test of that's now with LIGO. That's interesting. Right. Okay. So how's it how's it going? Well the the current best estimate for the upper mass limit experimentally is one point nine eight. That is most neutron stars have mass about one point four, one point five. There's a handful above that. There's one which is which the astrophysicists uh, can think they trust, which is a 1.97. And then there's a few measurements with large error bars above. So the prediction is holding on d- d- just. By the skin of its teeth. Hmm? By the skin of its teeth. By the skin of its teeth, which is the way we like it around here. <laughs> <laughs> because if somebody publishes a really reliable measurement of a neutron star of three or four solar masses, I have to write the paper saying this theory is wrong. And that I've been looking forward to for some time. (laughs) And um, the other one has to do with inflation, but since nobody here believes in inflation, I'll skip it. No, I think people do. Go ahead, go ahead. The other one starts off, if inflation is true, then... Let me get to, there's a slide on that. The, the, the reasoning is a little, is a little um, subtle. So if inflation is true, then delta rho over rho is a tunable parameter in, in many models of inflation. And there's an obvious rejoinder to everything I said. Why not just pump up delta rho over rho? If you pump up delta rho over rho, you can make lots of primordial black holes early and overwhelm any of this star stuff. So that's true, and I have to accept the idea that this theory does not s- succeed in a universe where delta rho over rho is tunable in an inflationary model. But some inflationary models, some of the particularly simple inflationary models, then it goes with one parameter and one field, like the coleman weinberg potential, have another feature, which is the number of e-foldings goes inversely to the parameter that governs delta rho over rho. So if you tune up delta rho over rho, you shrink the number of e-foldings, and you have to then do, a, do an estimate and to find out where is the most production of black holes. And the estimate shows, again, I'm not showing you detail, but the estimate shows that you make many more black holes by having a big universe with a small delta rho over rho with lots of stellar production of black holes as opposed to a tiny universe with lots of delta rho over rho. But there are other models of inflation in which the number of e-foldings in delta rho over rho are decoupled, and then the model, then the hypothesis is dead. So I have to end up predicting that if inflation is true, it's something like Coleman-Weinberg inflation with a single field, single parameter. So those models are on the edge of being rolled out? We love to be on the edge. So that was what I was going to no, say. it's just your, your living dangerous. <laughs> and with that, I thank you for your time. <laughs> what about the point of argument, whatever, that every star, if you wait long enough, will collapse into a black hole? What's the matter? By, by a fluctuation. <coughs> I think the example of Zadovich has written about 
just by a quantum, I mean, of course, you'd have to wait a very long time, but you're giving yourself forever. So, I, I still don't see so what, the, what, what, what is the mechanism. If it's full by quantum fluctuation, you form a seed black hole, and then it starts eating up. Of course, it's a very slow process. But baryons will decay before. That we don't know. Well, we do know the barrier in the camera. It's bigger. It's it's bigger than that. Yeah. So, what would be the final statement? Radiation. Just radiation. I, I believe so. I haven't compared it with this quantum fluctuation. I never thought <laughs> <laughs> But the quantum fluctuation is a black hole, so it's very, very rare. It, it, so if there's a parameter that governs that, it's not in the list of standard model parameters we know. So I, it doesn't test the hypothesis that I'm making. But it's a quantum gravity parameter. Well, which I'm not making any claims about. <laughs> I don't know. I, let, let me say, let me say something. Fine, even though I said I was done. To me, I mean, one invents ideas and one gets attached to them. But for me, the most important part of this idea is the last part that is falsifiable. That is, you can, you can write down discoveries that could be made by current technology, but if they are made, you would have to write a paper saying the idea was false. And what's most interesting to me about the idea is the structure of the idea, which leads to falsifiability, is to take on the idea that the parameters of the laws of nature are not fixed but can change in time. And that's the most interesting lesson of this to me. So, I mean, the one, the very big worry is that uh, inside a black hole you can make an infinite universe. What, what do you say about that? Because that seems to be allowed. If you allow, if you allow yourself to make a universe, there seems to be no limit on its spatial size. That is a worry, and because that would have an infinite number of black holes, and that would definitely kill the whole story. Oh, you, I, okay, so it is important for your story that each black hole makes a finite number yes. of progeny black holes. Otherwise, I have That's a measure important. problem like you wouldn't believe. Well, so does inflation. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. The uh, same kind of measure problem. It's the same kind of measure problem. Right. So, so you, so, and you believe that any good theory has to have a finite measure. For sure. Yeah. Good. For sure. Let me also say, there are lots of variants of this kind of theory one can invent. For example, you could say each black hole has 10 progeny, or each black hole has a number of progeny which grows with the power of the mass. And all of these are different assumptions. They can, some of them can be tested, some of them can't be tested. But the, my fear is, because a lot of people have written papers, well, not a lot, but a few people have written papers tweaking it in different directions. And they always make the theory safer from falsifiability. I want to be on that edge that Neil mentioned. I want to have a theory which is easy to falsify. And that means take the, usually means, and means in this case, take the simplest version. Don't try to complicate it. Don't make intelligent life responsible for increasing the number of black holes, for example. That's a beautiful hypothesis and would lead you to a story about how there's intelligent life in the universe because there was intelligent life in a bunch of previous universes. But that removes you from that. Then you're doing science fiction. You're not doing anything which is testable. Uh, uh, this, is, this idea goes back to when we were both in Syracuse. And yes. it's a very nice aspect of it, which is which I love it. But there's something that's always bothered me about it, which it has this kind of abstract, which similar to what bothers most people about the anthropic principle, which is there's a kind of measure that you're putting on universes, which is so that we should find ourselves in a more typical universe and not in an atypical one. Because if the story is right, then there will be universes with all kinds of different coupling constants. It's just that there'll be in some way of counting more which has a kind of coupling constants that, that you're talking about. But to turn that into a prediction of what we find in our actual universe, it seems to me there's a logical gap, which is that in some sense we're a typical universe. So let me... If we were chosen at random by some process, but, but we are. But I mean, that's the whole 
So the difference from, 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 from the Anthropic Principle, and this again is to me is an important lesson. And when I'm talking about lessons, I'm saying maybe people can go forward and invent much better hypotheses from these. This is just an example. So the, tip, the typicality, yeah. and, and this slide is about that. I, 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 don't, I won't unless you force me to go through it. This is my slide about eternal inflation and comparing. But the typicality is an essential element of the falsifiability, if you analyze it, how, how the logic works. If you can't say our universe is a typical member of the ensemble, you can't go from properties which are typical of the ensemble to properties that's of our universe. That's what yes. The, 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 what makes the standard use of, for example, an eternal inflation, the standard use of the anthropic principle vacuous is that they allow our universe to be highly atypical. And once you allow our universe to be highly atypical, there's no correlation or relation between the properties that we may measure in this universe and something happening in the ensemble at large, and you lose you lose the toughness, you lose the falsifiability. So that's, an, uh, Raphael, you may like it or may not like it, but typicality is an important part of the methodology here. And let me quote Simon Saunders from another conference we were at a few weeks ago, which we were talking about something else, and I said, I don't like X, and he looked at me and said, Lee, it's not about what you like, <laughs> or I like. <laughs> it's about what's true. But I'm just saying that you valid that assumption. That now, that assumption is a consequence of the assumptions of the model. Which is that which is, which is that uh, partly the assumption and partly the conclusion. The conclusion that the conditions needed to at least locally extremize the production of black holes are complex chemistry, carbon dioxide, water... These are the things that are normally taken as related to our existence, but they have nothing to do with our existence. They help the universe make more black holes. Right. But why should we find ourselves in a typical member of the ensemble? You don't get to... Uh, when you're not allowed to ask. I'm not allowed to ask. No. So, uh, that's fine. But I'm just saying, <laughs> you recognize that it's an axiom. It's an, it's an axiom. It's an axiom. Weird typical. Well... I know it puts you in a bizarre situation to stand up and say we're typical, especially <laughs> in an audience like this. But yeah, I don't want to be typical, but, but then as you say, it's not what you want. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you're typical, and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> to say that we're typical. Yeah. I don't know. To me. <laughs> if I had to choose, I don't know which one I chose, but. I, I'm only saying that it's an assumption whether yeah. I like it. Some people may like it. Some people. I mean, your, your universe you're ima imagining is infinite. It's infinite towards the future. Huh? Yes. Or I don't have to address that question because all I have to do is address that at some fine time in the past there was one seed universe which reproduced itself. Yeah, but, it, but there's no mechanism to ever stop this. No. Well, so it's infinite to the future. Yeah. At a certain point, uh, all the black so holes will go into this new universe. So well, I, I mean, I think there's a very fundamental dilemma. If you assume the universe is infinite in the future... A single universe. Right. The whole, the whole thing. Yeah, it, well, and the whole thing. Yes. The single one and the whole thing is just infinite. Then the only way to get a meaningful statistic is that in some sense it's statistically homogeneous over time. And space. Otherwise you can never make it. I, I disagree with that. I think it's, it's sufficient to say it's long enough in the past that these conditions which I described likely obtain. Just like in biology... That, 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 that is saying that there's a typical average. Yes. There is an average. But, the, but, the, but, there's everywhere. A, but, the, but, the, but you just need a, fine, a large but fine number of generations to get to that point. Well, to get as close as you can. That's right. And why aren't we arbitrarily far into the the number of these is going to grow. We could be. But if, but if you have a statistic... So if, you, if, you, if it's a then you could probably... Then you just say, I could be anywhere here. And it's if, you, if you go down this route, I, I don't know that I want to go down this route now, but I've gone down this route quite lengthily, mm -hmm. and I ended up a presentist. And that this is part of why I ended That's up a presentist. Presentist. Yeah. presentist is somebody who believes that only statements about the present have truth value. 
But that was a talk about history. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the past, and the past. I'm trying to read it. It sounds like a contradiction. Can I just ask a question? That's the. I mean, there's a lot of other stories. We look at this. Suppose I look at. It's a hypothesis about history. Look at history. Arabian history, and I, I, I'm fascinated by the like French Revolution, and I've read so many books that, you know, prove to Only me since meeting you am I fascinated by the French problem. Revolution. They are very convincing, <laughs> right? Right, and there's all this reason for, and it's it's very hard to get away from. Anyway, I'm just. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> this is clearly the end of a conference. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but look, Lee, to be serious, here. In some sense, that's the criticism. You're looking at the history and you're rationalizing, you know, the one history we have. Right. And how much, it is there to disentangle yeah. from the story you tell, how much it is that, you know, you're just a superb physicist that can read history and give me the right reasons for how things happen. You know, how much of that is a prediction and how much that is, is, a, is a looking into the past? Uh, that's that's a very fair comment. So, uh, how do we distinguish? Uh, the predictions are the things that could be falsified by future measurement. Okay, uh, maybe I missed. Okay. So I have another, sorry, I have another question. Just, well, just just long long no, 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 so much. It's partly related to the question that Neil and Dr. Yuri just instead it's the same scenario with in the bounce. In the bounds, you really know the lines where you grew in a single universe. This issue of the measure becomes different. I mean, it's again, so all you have is the age of the universe, and you're just sort of renormalizing or whatever. So, since you're anyway talking about these black holes seeding new universes and where one of those one of those branches out there, why not resort to a simpler model in which you simply have bounces as Everything we're talking about, and, well, he and does, you don't have the same. You don't have the same issues. Quite the same issues with the measures. That really depends, and I think you elucidated this point to me. After, after I made my comment during the second talk, you need causation. Yes. If without causation, then it's just as bad as usual eternal inflation That's because true. I can come up with a measure. I've got an infinite string of integers. How many even integers and how many odd integers are there? If I pick every other integer, they're all even or they're all odd. If I pick them, you know, I can come up with a measure that gives me any answer I want as soon as I have an infinite string of things that I'm trying to count. It's always a different way of slicing it up. So unless you have causation, which, Lee, I grant you, that's the, that's the thing um, that makes this really nice as compared to the eternal inflation story, because you know, there, there's a reason here <laughs> that, that things go in a certain way. Yeah, thank you. Um, that, without yeah. that, it's vacuous. I think with the with just the bouncing and having it randomized, you don't make any progress. That's just a, that's a temporal multiverse with all the problems. Well, well, you could have something that's actually evolving. Yeah. Yes. In the same way. But you need the causation part. You need the causation. So the next set of, I mean, so like you said, the change is, you know, it's a small change of whatever it depends on particular dynamics of the environment. But it's it's progression. And in that sense, it is causation. And here there are, you know, you're proliferating and branching out. Yeah, so let me support what Samari is saying because you didn't say the key thing. So first of all, I tried very hard to make a version of this work with a single universe. And I couldn't make anything work. And I'll be happy to go offline to tell somebody the, the failed ideas, but I won't waste your time with them. And I agree it would be better to have a work within the past of a single universe. And you told me yesterday or the day before about papers of Faye Dowker where something analogous is made to work in a causal set description of a single universe. And that deserves a lot of study because I could make it work. Okay. Now, Laura, let me just interrupt this discussion. Did you, did you have a comment? Because I saw you trying to make a comment and then you said... No, I just wanted to say that you can at any time design a measure because you have a finite number of universities. Yes, thank you. That's, that's an important, to me, that's an important point. Yeah, but he has a time. So if you know at what time you are, yeah. how does if you don't know about... Yeah. If it lives forever, if it's an infinite string, there's, 
there's a measure. There's an infinite black hole, then why do we have a finite number of universes? If the universe is infinite, there's an infinite number of black holes, and I have an infinite. Right, then I cannot run, as, as I said in reply to Neil, I have to take, to run this idea, I have to take the old-fashioned, and avoid the old-fashioned idea that at a fixed time, a fixed universe is finite volume. Which I know is an unpopular idea these days, but it's, it's certainly a possible idea, and I need it because I need to be able to count things. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I'm looking about how you count. Like, is the for instance, is merging of black hole goes against evolution, or is a tenth of the nine solar masses count less? I don't have to answer. Is? I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm not and sure. How, I much, how much that prediction depends on how you count? I, it does depend, but not much. Uh, assuming that merging is rare, I, it's not an important effect. But that's all I thought about that. It's an interesting are you, question. Are you, are you bothered that this theory depends on the existence of things which you can never see? Yes. That's why I like it much better. I would like much better a version. Yeah. I see. With a single universe. With a single universe. in principle, you could actually yes. see the whole history. Yes. Yes. But again, it's not what I like. But if you ask me what I like, <laughs> I dislike the strongly that aspect of it. But again, this is a template. I'm not advocating that our universe is like that. It's a template for a kind of method of reasoning which can lead to answering questions that we so far we can't answer. So, another question is, why is there no biodiversity? That is, why, why do we experience one standard model in one universe? And why not, like, in that part of the room, and then, uh, you know, a, a, a bio, and then in that part of the room, another, so that... Right. I, I, tried, I tried to, that's what I tried to make work. I tried to make a, a universe within... Within our, our causal past, there would be different domains and phase transition. Mm -hmm. In the different domains, there would be different values of the fundamental. Kind of, I just couldn't make anything. There are scenarios like that in which there are domain walls and so forth. There's material to work with, but I wasn't able to make anything that, repro that reproduced this logic. Maybe, the, I know you wanted to discuss some other things. So. There must be a reason why. I mean, the oh, the the old, so unique in some sense. Yeah, the, for, the, uh, for the, the old business, business study, would so there's a, I think the, I think there's a very striking alternative to all this logic, but it has an equally uh, worrying aspect, which is that we are in the center of the universe. <laughs> we live. This is all. The, this is all there is. That's the alternative. Is that this is all there is? There's a unique set of laws. That's how they work, and we just have to work out the consequences. And it gives this. That's the alternative. It's very appealing at some level. It's also very shocking because it means we are in the center. So Copernican is gone. No, it's not anthropic. It's just only one. Well, it goes back to your question why is the, the mass of the electron is the same? I mean, of course we have explanation. You know, it goes back to why it goes back to that. That's right. So it's no, super, why, why, super optimistic. Why is there only one electron? I mean, it's. Because we thought that because there is, you know, time is joke. Well, okay. So I had a discussion. So there's a few diversity. I had a discussion about this with Michael Atia. He's he's become rather mystical. He always does it because he has the luxury, and you know, it will come down to the number two. Everything rests on the number two. No, literally, and then you get to. You know, the standard model follows from Shabbat. <laughs> really mean, nice. It's, it's, it's fancy numerology, but you know, that is the alternative to this. There's, this only, fine, there's only one way. This fine man joke, right? Which, which yes. Yeah, yeah, there's this one. No, it's what? a wonderful fine man joke is that there's only one electron, because there's really only one electron. Well, it's Wheeler's joke. It's, 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 it's Wheeler's it's, it's it's joke. Well, it's Wheeler's joke. It's, it's, it's the only rational... Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy, but uh, what yes. else can we? Is exactly. Is there another? Why do you say we live in? The, why does it make us in the center of the universe? Whether it doesn't. Did you say we live in the center? If this is true. No, I, as an alternative to this kind of reason. No, if what you just said, yeah. which is an older idea, basically. Yeah. You said that if that's true, then we live in the center of the universe. Yeah. So what, why? Why does that? Well, it's mm -hmm. unique. Metaphorically, it's oh, being oh, metaphorical. There's not that there's other ones which we're not in. It's just no, exactly. There's only one. 
Yeah, I would much it's prefer. Not Pardon? It's not anti copernican in that sense. Well, within it's, this it's, one it's, universe, we're not necessarily in a state where it's <laughs> No, it's true. But if you say we, we are, we're in the center of all that exists. That's a bit what you know. Anti copernican. Anti copernican would be saying we're irrelevant. This is saying we're not the center of all. You know, we look out and see everything around us, but that's all there is. That's one possibility. I had the non philosophical question. Okay, one last non philosophical question. So you talk about the 27 parameters of the Stein model, but what if uh, the universe has a different model? So it's like, you know, more or less generations, different grid groups, and some of the characters. I thought so. I thought about it. The question is always to get, to get some edge with it. It's not an interesting thing to contemplate unless you can work out what the astrophysics could be. But, I mean, maybe that could answer why of those three generations work. Yes, I would love to be able to answer that. Of course, there is, there is, there's an answer that Nambu gave to that. Because that each time a bounce is created, there's another generation. The generations are literally generations. So there's only been two before? No, the, 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 these are only the lightest ones in the history. Oh, okay. Three. Good. Okay, so I think, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the last session that I'm on behalf of all the participants, which is kind of organizers very, very much. The very stability.